a part like this. This is a part for NASA for the space shuttle main engine. Yeah. I can get a just as good as, you know, off the shelf part. It's functional, it's ready to go. That's correct. What's up guys, Ian Sandusky from Lakewood Machine and Tool back here again for Practical Machinist. Today we're gonna go check out the Connecticut Center for Advanced Technology. This place is crazy. We're gonna be seeing brand new applications and brand new methods of creating steel parts, ceramic parts, composites. These are parts that are literally, when we say, you know, oh, don't worry about it, that part's not going to the moon. Some of these parts are literally going to the moon. Um, I really can't say more than that. I'm just gonna have to show you. Let's go in and take a look. I'm here with Jackie. Jackie, thank you very much for having us. Thanks Ian for being here. It's great to see you. So what does the center do and what is your role here for? My role is Chief Technology Officer, okay. and I'm super thrilled to have that role as a woman in technology. I came up as a materials scientist and an engineer, wow. so we're sitting here at CCATS space is located in the middle of Raytheon Technologies Research Center, right. where I started my career, and across the street is Pry Whitney. So we're really in the aerospace mecca here in Connecticut. Right. I joined the organization six months ago after my career over there. And CCAT has been in, in business for over 18 years. Oh, wow. So we really started out in the very aerospace and defense focus. But over the evolution of the organization, we serve really the supply chain and the industrial base across all industry sectors. Right. Here in Connecticut, we have medical devices, consumer products. We do rotocraft and shipbuilding. So there's so much that's being manufactured here in Connecticut. And what are some of the things that excite you most about the center today? Really, it's servicing our customers. We get federal funding, so we have customers of the Department of Defense, Department oh, right. of Energy, we've done projects with NASA. We work very closely with the Manufacturing USA Institute, so we have some projects there. We also get state funding from the, um, from the state of Connecticut, and that's really in support of economic development, helping all of the 4,000 supply chain companies oh, wow. that we have here in Connecticut. So there's a real diverse portfolio. We have leading edge technologies here. We're seated, well, we're standing here in our optimization and machining lab. Across the house, we have advanced design, automation, and metrology. So we have leading edge tech that we do development programs for. We're training the workforce, um, folks that are coming into the workforce, into manufacturing, and as well those upskilling the folks that have been in the industry for a while because technology is ever changing. So we have really cool technology here. We partner with our supply chain, the big OEMs, those lesser small mom and pop shops. And we're really just driving technology forward and pushing that adoption into the supply base. So not only are you guys doing the really cutting edge stuff and literally pushing the envelope, you're also yeah. helping companies get in at the bottom floor when it comes to automation and the more Absolutely. esoteric tech. Yeah, I mean, with the evolution of technology, if you think about the I4.0, Industry 4.0 revolution and that movement, automation, robotics, big data, non-destructive testing, I know that when we walked across the other side of the house, you immediately called that out. So technologies that companies may not necessarily have on their floor, we, they could come here. We could help them with their problems, solving problems, ha what challenges or pain points that they have, you know, smart factory, cybersecurity, like all the things that are driving us forward, we can help them working hand in hand with those, with really anyone in, across the state, but we know no borders. So we right. have you know, New England programs. We also work with folks across the country. So it's really ex an exciting time to be at CCAT because we're doing so much in support of our supply base. Absolutely, and now is the time when the supply base needs the most support. So you guys are doing a fantastic thing. Yeah. Here. So what are some of the things we're gonna see today at CCAT? We have advanced technology. So we have laser directed energy deposition systems. What we have right here is a five axis machine. So we do precision machining. We also couple that together. So we could build layer by layer additively. And then also there's a system way in the back there, our DMG Mori, that's a hybrid system. So right. we can do both, which is really amazing. So here is our adv additive technology side. We can walk across and we'll see our advanced design, automation, and metrology. Fantastic. Really cool things, I4.0, automation, robotics. That's what we have over there. I'm here with 
Jeff. Jeff, thank you very much for having us today. My pleasure. What's your role here at CCAP? Uh, I run the additive manufacturing group. So this is your baby. This, this is my baby. What is this that we're standing in front of right here? All right, so quick, a really quick overview. Additive is a combination or a family of technologies. All right, there's seven different uh, classifications of additive. We have five of those seven on site. Just under this roof? Just under this roof. Wow. So this is considered directed energy deposition. So uh, this is for making larger things. So right. this particular machine has a big build volume. It's got five feet by three feet by three feet. Oh, wow. So you've, you've got a lot of space in there. Uh, so, you know, someone that's interested in a large component, uh, large fixture, large jig, whatever, this, this is an ideal tool for it. Right. The other thing that we can do with this, which is really great, is that we can put something that exists already in here and add material to it. So you can take a part that's not necessarily starting life as a 3D printed product and print onto it. Correct. So we can add features, we can do repairs. You know, people have been welding to, you know, onto parts to do welds for, you know, two or 3,000 years. Yeah, right. Nothing new. <laughs> but with the laser that we use with this, it's a fraction of the energy than a traditional welding process. Right. So as a result, we're able to make repairs on things that might be heat sensitive or heat sensitive enough that you can't use a conventional process. This doesn't put heat into the part. It puts some heat into the part, but a fraction of the heat compared to a bigger TIG or some other traditional process. Now, what kind of industries are really getting on board with this style of, like this size of part? Is this mainly aerospace? Is this a lot of, you know, power generation? Who, who comes to use this kind of machine? Um, right now, for this particular application, probably a lot of aerospace. We're, you know, we do a lot of work in the aerospace industry. Right. Uh, Shipbuilding is coming on board with additive. Uh, oil and gas, as you mentioned, um, it's a little bit big for medical, but, but what we're really seeing a lot of people explore is the, the repair process aspect of it. And why don't you guide me through a couple of the things we have on the table here. I see some examples. Sure. So this is a great example of a, of a part uh, built from scratch with this technology. Right. So this is part of a heat exchanger. There's a helix inside, uh, a tube. This is built as a single unit. So the idea of uh, creating this any other way would be impossible. Because those literally twist it's, in a helix it's a the helix whole way down. inside the... And, and so it. essentially the fluid would run through here and you got water or coolant on the outside or vice versa. Correct. That's insane. So, and you said, I remember I looked at a part about this size. How long does that take to print This at that was size? about an hour at this size. And the material is? Uh, this is stainless steel. So you can get stainless steel at this size in an hour. Yes. That's insane. Yeah. The beauty of this machine is that we can use, you know, conventional uh, non-reactive materials. So steels, you know, ink and L's, that kind of thing. Right. But we can also do reactive materials because this is an argon filled chamber. So oh, really? we do titanium and we've done up the refractories. So. And the reason, if you don't know, titanium, what happens if you have a lot of titanium chips? Uh, it's called a titanium fire. And it's very bad. <laughs> and yes. it gets very hot. You want to avoid. Uh, another uh, interesting part, this is a traditional casting right. for a motor. Uh, this was uh, machine crashed into it. Traditionally, this could potentially be thrown away in scrap. scrap. The idea of trying to take and add material back and then remachine it, so uh, you know, eliminating scrap. These are just some test pieces. We've added a, a different variety of material to it to see which would uh, fuse best with the cast irons and uh, which would give the finished uh, mechanical characteristics that they were looking for. And is that something you guys do a lot up here? When someone comes to you with an issue like this, let's say they had a whole truckload of these fall off and all of a sudden they're all dented. You guys will go through and actually test out different varieties of materials and additive methods in order to give them the best result. Yeah, here again, our goal here isn't necessarily to, to be the person that's going to do it, but to develop the process, show that it's viable or not, uh, and then hopefully transfer the technology on to you. And I'm sure you sometimes learn just as much about what doesn't work as what does work, mm -hmm. and that can be valuable as well. Ab absolutely, yes. Excellent. What else do we have here that uh, we want to take a peek at? Uh, very quickly, this is kind of a neat piece. Uh, so this would traditionally be formed with a die, yeah, which would absolutely. cost uh, ten plus thousand dollars easily. This is a new shape, and so the company wanted a set of these built. We built them additively, 
They were then able to take them. This has a, a thickness of about one and a half millimeters. Wow. It has the same mechanical characteristics as sheet metal. That's one and a half millimeters. They were able to crimp them together, test out the finished shape before they spent the money on having the foils made or because the dies made. The only other way you could do this if you were doing it out of aluminum would be something like an extrusion die. Yes. And then your minimum push is a thousand pounds or whatever. This really is an economical way to get not only the shape, but like you said, the mechanical characteristics. Right. So Once again, they can prove out this shape works. This is what we want. Now we're going to go have the dies. Do you find a lot of customers or people you know out there are doing this style of testing before they get those dies made, or is this kind of a new thing people are getting into? We're, people aren't breaking down our door to do this, but it's just one more aspect of. I mean, 3D printing, additive manufacturing grew up around rapid prototyping. Right. Exactly. So this is just another form of rapid prototyping where you're you're reducing your cost to bring a new product uh, to market, basically. That is absolutely crazy. The one other thing I wanted to uh, take a quick look at here is what do we have back here? Because that is frightening looking. This guy here? That is thin, that is tall, this, and it looks like stainless. This is TIE 64. Oh, wow. So uh, this is just a test piece that we built. Here again, uh, you're doing basically a, a controlled laser process. So typically, you would see a lot of stresses right. in, uh, in warping. And this is just a, a really quick piece to show that we could have built this three feet long if we wanted Completely to. Completely unsupported. Completely unsupported. With, uh, with minimal stressing. So, and then last but not least, we'll do this, is uh, this is a test piece we did not do here. This is with some folks that, uh, that we're working with, but this is an aerospace part. Right. This starts as an 1,100 pound forging. They machine it and they end up with a 75 pound part. So they're, they're trashing 1,000 pounds of Easily. TIE 64. Easily, 96% of the weight. So the concept here is to start with a smaller ring, add the features that they want, and then do the finished machining. This is not what you want titanium to look like. Uh, it was exposed to too much oxygen during the process. But that's titanium that's been put on there. Yes. Wow. But So this is a great example here again why a lot of companies are calling this game changing as far as the way you know parts are made. Because even here, just to, just to illustrate that, this would be something kind of similar in terms of process. They would go and put the metal on there like that and then you turn it around, you can machine that just like anything else. Absolutely, it's fully solid. So this is also titanium. Oh, that's titanium as well. Yeah. Wow. Jeez, so we do nice a lot too. of, uh, this particular machine has an adjustable laser beam uh, width or the right. spot size. So we can control how much material and, and how much we can deposit. So a lot of, of stuff that we're doing, it's finer for more finesse kind of parts. Right. Uh, but we can adjust it up to about three or four millimeters in diameter and put down uh, a lot shot. of material. Wow. And then these kinds of systems are easily adaptable. So this was done with wire and a laser, uh, but you know they have electron beam systems as well. <laughs> cutting, so, cutting edge stuff. Yes. So, Jeff, how did you get involved in this industry? How did you end up here at uh, CCAP? Long story short, um, I worked for Pratt & Whitney in okay. Florida. I worked next door at United Technologies Research Center. Uh, my work at the research center involved laser, um, using high-powered lasers. When I came to CCAT, I had a different role. I was actually responsible for getting buildings up and running. Oh, um, crazy. And I ended up over in the lab when they needed somebody that had touched uh, high-powered lasers before. So uh, 10 years ago, uh, I volunteered to come over until they hired uh, uh, a formal uh, laser engineer to come in and do it. And uh, 10 years later, I'm running the group. And here you are. So here I am, <laughs> yes. So my background in optics and lasers uh, gave me the background that I needed to, to do this. But with that said, um, you know, we do a lot of work with schools right. and with machining companies. And so, you know, if you are uh, a person, you know, working in the machine trades, you probably have most of the knowledge that you need in order to work in this field. Really? So we're using the same CAD models, we're, we're using G-code, we're programming these systems, 
Um, so probably, really, realistically, 90% of it is what you would would learn being a machinist. It's and that translatable in the machine between machining and additive. It is very translatable, yes. So Jeff, I recognize the name on this, but I do not recognize the model. Laser melting system, what are we talking about when we say that? Okay, so this is a Renishaw powder bed fusion system. So powder bed fusion, just like directed energy, uses uh, powdered metal mm -hmm. and a laser beam. In this particular case, uh, you start with a build plate, you smooth or screen a, a thin layer of powder, the laser beam takes the information from the CAD model, uh, melts the powder, it drops, it spreads another layer, melts the powder, oh. and so you end up with a box filled with powder and the parts in the, in the box. So essentially you pull out the part out of the powder when it's done. Yes. It, maybe not, but close enough. But close <laughs> enough, close enough. So this particular technology, once again, powder bed fusion, over there, directed energy deposition. Right. This is probably the technology of choice right now for most people that are making new parts. And why is that? The reason is that you can, uh, you can build very complex, very intricate parts Jeez. with it. So here again, that's part of a heat exchanger. You couldn't build that any other way. Li there's literally no way. There's literally you no way. You couldn't injection mold it. You couldn't machine it, certainly. You couldn't sink EDM it. There's one way to do it, and I guess it's this. And it's this. So here again, uh, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, making very intricate parts that are hard to do conventionally. The other thing that they're using it for is consolidating parts. So this part is built with a screen in place and a number of other features, but this is a great example of showing uh, how um, complex the part can be, how fine the features can be. Uh, so very, very powerful manufacturing tool. Like that is literally a screen integrated. Yes. And that's stainless steel as well. Uh, that is, yes. This, or, or, or titanium, but these are, this is not powdered aluminum or resin. This is strong, strong material. Yes, it, and it could be powdered aluminum. It could be powdered aluminum if yeah. you wanted to, if the yeah. application suited it. Yes. But as you're seeing here, these are, what is that, maybe 30 thou thin, fins? Yeah, it's really, it's really thin. And then that mesh in there is absolutely tiny. Now what industries or what kind of companies are you seeing that are investing in this technology right now? Again, is that aerospace? So maybe? here again, um, the early adopters for this technology, aerospace, uh, medical industry, oh. dental. A and dental? Yes. What, what, is, what is the dental industry doing with this? So they're building uh, inserts for teeth, they're building scaffolding for reconstructive surgery. Um, so the beauty of this, another attribute of, of additive, mm -hmm. is the ability to do mass customization. Uh, so you can take a build plate, you can build, uh, let's say, a, a dozen different uh, you know, dental scaffolds right. for a dozen different patients, each one totally customized for that particular person and build them simultaneously. All in one shot. And yeah, it takes just a little bit longer to build a dozen of them as it would to have built so one. So extremely economical for very complex prototype style work. It can be, yes. Wow. Or, for, you know, here again, for a highly customized work. Uh, the powder in this that doesn't get incorporated into the part is reused for the most part. Just dumps right out. So put it back you, the you clean it, sieve it, mix it with some new, but ultimately there's very, very little waste in the process. And what's this part here? I was, I was playing around with this earlier and this is yeah. incredibly light. Yes, so this is a great example of advanced design. So this is uh, uh, topology optimized and um, uh, generatively designed, but this is a hinge. A part, hinge? A hinge for actually for a gull wing door for a concept car. Oh, wow. And um, so this was created, uh, it's structurally as strong as one that would be machined out and much bulkier than this. Wow. But by using light weighting tools, advanced design, uh, this weighs a fraction of what a traditionally manufactured part would weigh. And when you're talking about generative design, what does that mean for those who don't know? It means that we're, we're telling the computer we're interested in attaching in these points. It has to see these stresses. It's made from this material and then let the program do the basic design. Kind of like AI, right? Exactly, AI. That's why you get these really cool, almost organic structures in there because that's just what the computer has figured out is the most effective way or strongest way 
while I'm sure that one of the parameters was we want it as light as possible. Absolutely. Very, very cool. You know, here again, the rocket industry, aerospace, medical dental. This is some, uh, a test piece that was made. Uh, this is for the oh, wow. fuel cell industry. So these are 750 microns. So what's that, 30? Maybe, thousands, yeah. Uh, holes that run the length of this. Which and you just can't, plane cannot do in any other way. Not You're really. You're not gonna be able to keep that drill from wandering unless you have some very specialized equipment, especially in that quantity. Yes. And so we have actually a number of these that we're going to be building for another company uh, that are eight inches in diameter. Eight so, inches? Yeah, so there'll be almost 4,000 holes. And what would the print time be on something like this, roughly? Um, to build one of those is about uh, three days, four days. Wow. Yeah. And now would this be final part ready to go or would this go for secondary machining? Um, it could be almost everything that you build if surface finish or dimensions are absolutely critical there's probably some kind of a post-processing process. Right. So uh, whether it be machining or grinding or polishing, polishing yeah, de-blasting, you, you name it. So, and then the other thing, you know, some other parts, uh, this is not a good part for additive manufacturing right. because it's bulky and that traditionally it doesn't have the complexities, doesn't have any of the attributes with it other than it's a tapered brooch. Right. And so that makes it difficult to manufacture. Definitely. So the guys that we made this for uh, are in the valve industry. And so, um, you know, they, they really love this concept. Now, why would they use this in this example instead of something like fourth axis on a wire EDM? Uh, it, it, it was just a test piece. We were comparing technologies. Interesting. So yeah. you guys will do comparative studies like that Absolutely. to determine which one's going to be the most cost effective. Yes. And effective. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's part of what we do. So what are we looking at here? So this is a binder jetting system. Binder jetting. Yes. Okay. So what this does is it uses metal powder, very similar to the Renishaw machine. Right. But instead of a laser beam, uh, we have a print head and it sprays literally a binder. Interesting. And so when you get done with it, you have parts that are buried inside a, a box of powder. You depowder the parts uh, and then you wow. center them to get rid of the binder and to solidify them. And what is, what is sintering for those who don't know? So that's putting it in a furnace um, for about a day oh, at, at elevated temperature. You're basically putting, in, you're putting your dough in the oven and you're cooking it. You're cooking it. So when you're done, you come up with a part that is the equivalent of metal injection molding. Wow. So uh, you can create very intricate parts. So this is a block that was created uh, uh, for Ford by X1. And uh, so, but you don't have the heat necessarily in the laser process. Um, this is a research size machine. Wow. So the full production size machines of this are the size of this machine. So you can literally make hundreds or even thousands oh, of wow. parts. So it's much more geared towards serial manufacturing processes. Some kind of production type yes. work as opposed to something like this where it's more one-off prototype style. Yeah, smaller quantities, larger quantities, higher metal quality, a little bit lower metal quality. The finish on that is still pretty remarkable though. Yes. Like, if you told me that was a cast part and I didn't know, I believe you. Yes. Well, here again, it's competing with casting. Right. So if you have a, a, a part that you need only a handful of, of parts, uh, rather than going to a casting house, people are direct printing them. You can print a variety of metals with this. You can uh, print in a variety of ceramics. Oh, ceramics. And well. even casting companies are starting to get these, and they print in sand. So they're making their molds and their cores uh, using this kind of technology. So instead of using metal, you could use sand in this? You could, yes. Wow, that's really out of the box. Who, what kind of companies are putting these in right now besides casting companies? What kind of work is more focused here with that production aspect as opposed to something like the Renishaw? Um, companies, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Well, uh, the automotive industry okay. is beginning to adopt this. I guess that's so, why you're doing these for Ford. <laughs> so, yeah, well, and uh, uh, BMW, you oh, know, really? VW, yeah, are, are uh, bringing on this kind of production. So here again, 
uh, ab, you know, places where you need a higher production quantity, right. price is more significant, and you don't need the the absolute quality that you get from one of the laser processes. Interesting. So and these are all yeah. the solvents and binders and stuff below. Yeah, it's just simply a binder and a cleaner. That's crazy. So it's uh, it's a pretty basic system. And now this thing, this whole head, we're not going to do it right now, but this whole head comes up. That's the way you manipulate everything inside. Yeah. So and here like again, a freezer. Exactly. <laughs> and so here again, the idea, we have this as a research tool. Right. So that if a company comes to us, uh, we can change materials, we can change binders, we can figure out, does this make sense for you? Uh, before you make the decision to buy it. And, and then you can go and scale up from there. Yes, there's actually uh, companies in the state that are, are looking to onboard this. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is this is pretty cutting edge. I've never, I, I mean, I'm not an additive machining guy. I've heard of those. I've never even heard of this. So yeah. this is fascinating. So the fact that the automotive industry is interested in it, um, there's a couple of OEMs that only produce production equipment. Right. And they're starting to produce binder jet equipment. Binder. So it's really, to me, it's an up and coming technology. It's, it's, it's pretty much 3D printing for metal without a laser. It's Yes. we're taking a look at a hybrid machine. What I see in front of me is a giant metal. What makes it a hybrid machine? Okay, so it's a hybrid machine, number one, because it's a mill turn, it's which makes turn. it a hybrid, <laughs> yeah. but it's also a hybrid machine because we have an additive head that we can, can bring over and pick up. So, so that's a metal printing So that's a metal tool. printing tool. So it uses powdered metal just like the other processes and a right. laser beam. So uh, this actually moves in. Uh, it picks it up in the spindle just like any other tool. Oh, it tool changes straight into the spindle. Yes. So then uh, we can, you know, start building additively. Right. Uh, when we get done with the additive process, that tucks back into its little garage. This has a 60 tool tool changer on it. So, oh, it's got a big magazine on it. Yeah. So you just uh, pick up your tool, do whatever process you want to do, and here again. Uh, you know, we've been doing milling for, you know, 200, 250 years for right. the Industrial Revolution. Um, everything you do, in, and that's how really high-end precision parts are created. Have to be at um, this juncture until. <laughs> until, but everything's line of sight. So I can right. only machine what I can get my tool into. Exactly. With additive, powerful tool, I can create things that I can't create any other way. Um, but I can only create what I can get my laser beam into. Right. When you combine them into a single tool, it's incredibly powerful. It lets you bury features that are also accurate features, That's right? correct, because you can switch back and forth and do whichever process you need whenever you need to do it. So in the same part, I could go additive, subtractive, additive, subtractive. Yes. As many times as I want it. Yes. So one of the, one of the sample parts that, that we like is the impeller. Right. So this is hollow on the inside, so you can see it was, it was done additively. Oh, wow. But this part started as a flat build plate. Uh, the trumpet or cone section was built. It was turned. The uh, fins were added, uh, and complete five axis, by the way. The fins were added additively, and then they were finished machined. So generally, if you were making this from a solid, you would have to start with a big cylinder. Yes. And you just have to go through, and it's a lot of material waste. There's a lot that can go wrong. With this, you started with something like this. Yes. A build plate. Yep. So there's no waste. Or at least if there's waste, there's very minimal. I mean, you're going to clean up the surface, there's, but you're not scrapping half the part into chips. That's the, And that's correct. It's minimal waste. So um, in the last two machines we looked at, uh, last three machines we looked at, you can reuse the powder. Right. All right. Because we wet process in this and machine, we don't reclaim the powder here. But you're still but wasting a lot less. When than you're you... building a part, you're capturing about um, 70 to 80 percent of the powder. Oh wow. So it's only you know 10, maybe 20 at, at, uh, percent waste. This particular part um, took uh, just under five hours. That's quick. So we think that machining that out of a block, it'd probably be about 10 hours. Oh, easily. And easily. you know, 
we're thinking if you machine that out of a block because it's 316, you're probably going to go through multiple tools. If you want any accuracy, definitely. Yes. So this, it's now a question of how many of these can I build with a set of tools. Right. And, and how much can I save in time and, and uh, material. Because for those who don't know, especially when it comes to five axis machining, impellers kind of are the gold standard test, or at least for years. I remember when people were first starting to do impellers a lot. Everybody at the trade shows were bringing out their impellers. This is what our machine can do. This is what our tooling can do. Mm -hmm. So it kind of makes sense that when you're looking to test the limits of a machine like this, naturally, an impeller. Yes. And then that would lead us to a part like this. This is a part for NASA, for the Space Shuttle main engine. For the Space Shuttle main engine. And uh, which wow. is the Space Launch System engine. Now. Right. And so this was made completely additively. 100% additive. 100% additive. Uh, NASA's goal is in the next 10 years to develop a, a engine that is completely additively manufactured. Why would they want to do that? Uh, reduction in cost, uh, a whole lot, a uh, big, huge reduction in uh, fabrication time. Right. And weight, I guess, too, right? Because you well, can do different Well, ultimately, here again, aerospace is the other industries, or space is looking to consolidate parts. Right. So you're reducing weight, you're consolidating parts. You're making you know, very complex parts that are, are difficult at best or impossible to do conventionally. Now, when you made this, this would be multiple layers of print and machine. Uh, that's correct. So this, the tube section was built up, machined, and then the fins were added afterwards. That's absolutely and crazy. then finished machined. And what's the, uh, what's the material on that one? This one is 316, but, 316 but the finished parts were 718. And for those who don't know, 316 and a lot of these grades of stainless, they have a high chromium content, high nickel content. Very, very hard to machine. They burn out cutters. Um, they work hardened if you aren't getting proper coolant mm -hmm. on there. You mess it up and you crash your cutter in there and it work hardens, throw it in the trash. You're starting again. So to eliminate that is very helpful. Yes. So in this piece, um, here again, we can talk about uh, it's a, a small case. This started out as a flat build plate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we did not finish the inside or outside. That's what makes it so cool, though. But yeah. But this was uh, about seven hours. Seven hours yeah. from start to finish from with the machine. Start machining. to finish. So here again, to me, the big thing with this isn't necessarily the time that it took. Right. But if you had to wait for a casting to come in, you can wait weeks or even months. Eas right now, you right can now, wait months. You could wait a year. Absolutely. And so the idea that you could design something and in eight hours um, hold it in your hand. And that's the thing that I think is important to note with this. It's not just rapid prototyping to see, is this going to work? It can be for repair orders or if Correct. you know I need something now, yes. I can get a just as good as you know off the shelf part today in my shop. Yes. Not just, hey, let's mess around with this and see if it's gonna work. It's functional, it's ready to go. That's correct. The one thing I did see around sure. here when I was poking around was bimetallic parts. Yes. How does this work? So here again, this machine has multiple hoppers, right. just like the first machine did. So the idea, this was actually built from a substrate, an existing part that right. we added Inconel onto. But so this is Inconel on the outside. Yeah, this is 625 on the outside, and then there's a variety of copper alloys that we've used. Crazy. But this could have been built completely from powder as well. Right. There's nothing that would stop us from doing that. But the ability to actually, that's, that's fully binded. That's not... It's fully, it's it, fully not, fused, it's not press fit, it's, it's uh, you know, mechanically fused together. Right, the grain structure is continuous. Yes. If you did it all in one shot. Is there anything else here? Oh, the one thing too, you were showing me before we went on yeah. camera. Do you mind explaining what this is here? This is absolutely fascinating. Sure, so here again, we can use multiple materials with this. And so this particular uh, part is, uh, I think, stainless steel to uh, 4340 transition, but it's non-magnetic down here, and then it transitions into a uh, magnetic area. So literally it goes from non-ferrous or non-magnetic into magnetic in the same part. And is there a gradient in there? Or there is. You can, you can cut from one to another, or you can grade 
infinitely you know, variable between the two. And why is that so interesting? Um, the reason for it is that designers, when they see that start to drool, exactly because they can build a park potentially, I, I always use that word, that potentially, that has characteristics in one part, maybe it's cheaper metal here, right. and they need something that's wear resistant, chemical resistant, temperature resistant, uh, or has some other characteristic, and so now you can go from one to another. So you could literally have the high wear end here and something that's a lot more malleable or flexible on this Whatever end. Whatever So you're not going to break something. You can, you know, for, you can select for different characteristics of the metal. So here again, the oil and gas is a great example where they're making drill heads yep. using this technology with exactly that, more malleable oh. uh, versus a more aggressive cutting area. Absolutely and, amazing, because then the drill's not going to snap. You could have a more flexible core, super hard outside and tough. Yes. Crazy. And yes. is this seeing application yet, or is this still very much in the design phase? It's it's seen uh, it's it's in the design phase. Let me put it that way. Right. We're doing a lot of uh, work with people that are interested in exploring this. So we're alternating layers. We're we're grading all kinds of different materials together. Um, I can't talk about all of the applications. Of course. But, um, uh, but ultimately, there's a lot of interest in that. Um, you know, it's probably a ways off from a production Right now, you guys right are now. pushing the envelope as far as it can go and seeing what it can do. Yeah, we're, and here again, I guess to, to capitalize on what Jackie was saying, a lot of our work, um, you know, is working with researchers right. and working with the Department of Defense and, you know, other government and academia and, sure. and research institutes. Uh, our primary focus really though is on the application of this. So I have a machine shop, I'm interested in exploring this technology, does it make sense? What can I do with it, does it make sense? And so those are the kinds of folks and kinds of questions that we, we work with every day. Amazing, mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. It's a fascinating application, a fascinating thing to get to do on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Jeff, right. thank you very much for having us today. So it's our pleasure. Thank you very much for being here. Really appreciate you showing us around. Uh, it was uh, exciting to, to share with you guys and, uh, and your, uh, your audience. So looking forward to that. And where can we find you online? Uh, you can reach us at ccat.us. Uh, okay. And uh, we're also on Instagram and LinkedIn. Excellent. Thanks again for showing us around. You're you welcome. Have a great day. Thank you.